Hello there, good evening and many thanks for joining us on Rwanda Television News tonight. My name is Sam Kalisa. And mine Martina Herrera. How are you Martina? I'm very good, how are you doing? Very great as well. Yes. And as we start off? off? Yes, starting off on the top story tonight, the prosecution of the International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals has ruled that Felicier Kaboga played a major role in creating hatred against the Tutsis demonizing them and fueling the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi that took over one million lives. This was announced by the prosecutor's office in The Hague in the Netherlands on Thursday morning as the trial of genocide architect uh, Kavuga Felician uh, began. Beginning of Kavuga's trial, the prosecution prior to presenting the evidence explaining how the crimes Felicia Kavuga is accused of were committed and where they were committed. The prosecution disclosed that Kabuga was among the principal founders of RTLM Radio and together with those who co-founded it, used it to teach and spread hate speech followed by criminal activities that targeted the Tutsi. The prosecution revealed that the programs that were broadcast on the radio often gave out the list of Tutsis to be killed plus uncovering where the victims were hiding. The prosecution explained that Kabuga first supported the Inherahamni in Muhima and Chimirongo areas in the city of Kigali and later left Kigali for Jisenyi in mid-April 1994. While in Jisenyi, Kabuga was at the forefront of the efforts to ensure the availability of weapons and continued to support the Inherahamni to carry on with the killings. A statement released by the Prosecutor General of the International Criminal Residue Mechanism reads, Today, Victims of Kabuga's crimes and all Rwandan people should be in the forefront of our thoughts. They have waited 28 years for justice. My office is committed to holding Kabuga accountable on their behalf. This trial will also be an opportunity to remind the world again of the grave dangers of genocide ideology and hate speech. Kabuga had a central role in provoking hatred of Tutsis, dehumanizing innocent civilians and paving the way for genocide. If we are to prevent further genocides, all of us must be vigilant against such incitement. Ethnic, national, racial, and religious hate speech is not hard to identify. What is needed is the will to stop it in its tracks. Alain Gauthier, president of Collectif de Parti Civil pour le Rwanda, an organization that intends to ensure that genocide suspects are brought to book, says that the fact that Kabuga is on trial sends a strong message. J'espère que ce procès permettra d'en connaître un peu plus sur la façon dont il est arrivé en France. I hope that this trial will reveal how he got in France and those who helped him. Uh, this trial is very important because he is the financier of genocide. However, uh, I don't believe he will tell us much, but I hope he will tell the truth uh, about his role in the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. At the end of the rulings, prior to the presentation of evidence, the prosecution said that Felicia Kabuga, acting in the cause of extremist beliefs, played a key part in bringing about crimes and the almost unimaginable suffering that was unleashed across Rwanda in 1994. Felicia Kabuga, who was a businessman before and during the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi, is charged with seven counts including genocide, complicity in genocide, direct and public incitement to commit genocide, attempt to commit genocide, and conspiracy to commit genocide. Other charges include persecution and extermination, both as crimes against humanity. Kabuga, 87 years old, was arrested in May 2020 in Paris, France, putting an end to a 26-year run. And we'll keep it to matters related to justice. The president of the Supreme Court, Dr. Faustine Zidiayo, urged arbitrators to have integrity and put more efforts into improving what they do so that they can contribute to the development of the country. Meanwhile, on Thursday, the Ekigali International Arbitration Center celebrated 10 years of providing its services. Olive Nete has this report. In the 10 years that this arbitration institution has been operating in Rwanda, they registered more than 200 cases, of which 40% are international cases. Bundu Fosten, the chairperson of the Kigali International Arbitration Center, pointed out that although there are a number of achievements to celebrate, there is still need to work hard to maintain what has been achieved. 
I remember uh, 31st of May in 2012. That's when we launched this center. And it was uh, a great milestone <coughs> because it was um, Rwanda's business community. It was a dream for the Rwanda business community to put in place an institutional mechanism to support business operators to resolve their disputes through the use of arbitration and other alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. Today we're here to assess ourselves against objectives we had set 10 years ago. 10 years may not be a long time, but it's an important milestone. It is an opportunity to celebrate, but most importantly, a space to adopt the way forward since we must still grow stronger. Professor Dr. Mohamed Abdel Wahab, one of the key partners, reiterated on what can be done to promote the profession worldwide. What I think the continent needs to do and Africans need to do is a lot of more capacity building, uh, training, understanding of the role of the rule of law and how international arbitration uh, is uh, really uh, important for any peace process for any proper resolution of disputes. It's by and large the business community's number one choice for resolving disputes. And Africa is not alien to that. Throughout the history of Africa, international arbitration was existent, whether in customary, tribal, or other uh, practices. And now is the time for Africans to build on that by, through education, knowledge, uh, acquiring the needed skills to make it to the international world and present the talent that exists on the continent. The President of the Supreme Court, Dr. Fostene Zidjayo, praised the role of this institution in the development of the country, but also urged those who practice this profession of arbitration to be characterized by integrity. Integrity matters. It matters in other matter, but it matters also in arbitration proceedings. And check services are therefore crucial, and they was and they are even now crucial in fostering investment and contributing to the reducing backlog of cost cases, thus raising efficiency of the administration of uh, justice. TIAC growth trajectory has been remarkable during these last 10 years, thanks to the support from various stakeholders. But this trend needs to be sustained if the center is to attract more national and international arbitration cases and to ensure its commercial viability. It is advisable that they ought to be a balanced combination of experts in a civil law jurisdiction, but also lawyers trained in the common law. The Institute also points out that since its inception, it has trained more than 300 local professional arbitration practitioners, of whom 80 have been accredited as arbitrators. This institution is also home to about 200 lawyers. It also registered about 120 international arbitrators and is currently listed among the top three arbitration institutions in Africa. Olive Nete, RTV News. Thank you, Olive Nete, for that report. Now, moving on, the integration of artificial intelligence has provided solutions for various sectors in Rwanda and has been anticipated to significantly enhance development. Precious Chirezi has the report. Artificial intelligence is crucial to the use of technology. It's the reason computers can perform tasks at immediate request, which is how we can explain the autopilot operations of drones that are operated by the Zipline company that are used to distribute vaccinations and antidotes to properties, for example. We do. Uh, for us at Zipline, our focus is the delivery of goods, vital goods, to anyone, anywhere. Right now in Rwanda, we are serving basically practically the whole country. We are working with over 400 uh, health facilities and hospitals across the country. That's uh, for the delivery of blood and medical products. We are also serving uh, veterinarians and other workers who work with the with RAB, the Rwanda Agriculture and the, uh, uh, Animal Resources Development Board in the delivery of uh, pig artificial insemination products and animal vaccines of different sorts. We're also working in the distribution of child nutrition products. 
Zipline has two branches in the districts of Mohanga and Kayonza. They started provision of blood transportation services in 2016 and they're currently working with 400 hospitals as well as making 600 air trips daily. And this year alone, 400,000 trips have been made with Zipline planes. Uh, we want to make sure that as we go forward, the application of these technologies that Zipline has brought to Rwanda make it easier for Rwandans to get access to vital goods. Uh, we focus a lot on health, so we are thinking about how we can make it easier for everyone to have equitable access and in-time access to the medical products and other vital products that they need. So as we are growing and looking forward, really we are, we are looking at how do we apply these technologies uh, on the robotics and artificial intelligence side of what we see in the drone, but also beyond that in terms of what we call forecasting uh, to really help each facility that we work with, each uh, different stakeholder that we work with, to get them access to the goods that they have, not just here in Rwanda, but really looking beyond how to make sure that our partnerships, our collaboration can be uh, beneficial to them as well. Artificial intelligence has not only impacted healthcare but also various sectors like agriculture. Kayonga Akno is one of the young people working on solving the hindrances faced by the agricultural sector using drones that have, in his perception, helped with instant analysis of information prior to decision making. Uh, System is a tech company. Uh, we help uh, um, the agricultural se sector. Uh, to enhance or, uh, their uh, production in uh, efficient ways. And uh, the way we do it is through uh, helping, um, delivering uh, or collecting uh, uh, information uh, from, from the um, agricultural field. Um, our technologies are based on uh, drone, drone technologies and uh, artificial intelligence for processing the data. And uh, using drone technologies, we go to the fields, uh, farmers' fields, and uh, collect their um, various uh, data. Like, for example, one of our key products is uh, detecting land usage. Uh, uh, so, let's say if a farmer is using, um, we go and uh, see how much of a farmer is using his uh, farm or her farm. Uh, with that, we collect an image and process it uh, using artificial intelligence and come back to the farmer or maybe the government which has lent the, the, the land and tell him uh, that he's not using the land correctly. Financial institutions are using artificial intelligence to access information regarding their performance that is delivered within a day as opposed to six months of data collection and analysis, which is how long it takes to do it without digital assistance. Lipper Labs is a company that provides other companies with knowledge on artificial intelligence. Actually, Irembo has helped people to focus on the important. You will find that the people who were giving these services Irembo was giving, now they are not focusing on signing papers, you know, giving people clearances. But now maybe they are going deeper into what the problems citizens have. Yeah? They are, let's say, visiting the, the poor people. They are knowing uh, who is uh, in a bad uh, situation, who, is, who needs a help, who needs, you, you see? Like now people can focus on the important because we reverse the opportunity that machines can do some of the work that actually humans shouldn't be doing. The managing director of the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution of Randall points out that the infrastructure put in place by the country in support of technology is positioning different industries to rapidly develop. So AI can has a lot of um, potential in increasing productivity in general in the agriculture sector and other sectors as well. Um, in terms of uh, company level or organization level benefits, this is really, like I said, around uh, improving sales, improving revenues, improving profits uh, for companies or for organizations. Um, and so uh, how this works is companies can use uh, historical data on their customers, so purchasing patterns, um, customer preferences, and you can use this to determine, for example, when do customers buy certain products, like at what, at what part of the year that 
product X, does it make the most sales, for example? And so you can use that to better uh, plan for your operations to be able to service that demand in the future. The new Norscan Networking Hub and the Coding Academy in the Northern Province are the most promising institutions for experts to better advance technology. Norscan now has over 100 companies committed to technological innovations in the finance, agriculture, health, and education sectors. Precious Tidesi, RTV News. Now to health matters, some of the patients with uh, brain tumors that are being treated at the University Teaching Hospital of Kigali, Sehash Uka, are grateful for the experts from the United Kingdom who are helping to save lives of the many. Nuria Tagasaro has this report. Rujenga Manzi, a patient at Sehash Uka, tells how he was cared for and operated by those doctors when his life was in danger. <laughs> I was kicked by the cow, and I hit my head on the ground. I ignored it at first, but as the day passed, the pain grew worse, until it was severe. I rushed to the hospital. They operated on me to remove the blood clot that was trapped on my head, and I can already feel that my life is back. Dr. Muneza Severier, a head of neurosurgery, say that while spending time with those experts, they learned a lot and we improved the development of the country, adding that medicine is progressing in Rwanda and the number of diseases is increasing as well. That is why they need some help of the experts who are coming from the developed country. The number of patients increases every day because in a year we treat more than 700 patients in these neurosurgery services. But that leaves 200 or 300 patients on the waiting list. The issue is different. Reducing the number is difficult, but when we had an opportunity like this, the number decreased. There are situations that require several hours of surgery, such as this patient we operated on this week. And there are patients who can take all day, so you can see how tough it is to reduce the number of cases. Dr. Sam Mukwit, a member of the team of specialist doctors who is about to complete the operation of brain surgery known as neurosurgery at Seashiuk Hospital, says that he's happy with his fellow doctors at this hospital to be able to save the life of the patient in a short time and well. All the technical skills, they're very, very good doctors you have here. They're very, very talented doctors. Um, they need the, the facilities, they need all the equipment which is coming. And I think with joint working, with uh, discussions, we can have, you know, maybe online, we can have visits, we can learn from each other, we can do for continuing training. And medicine's about continuing to learn, continuing to build our experiences and our knowledge base. So that's for everyone everywhere, all doctors everywhere. So that's what we're hoping will happen. It will happen, I'm sure, uh, and we continue to do the same. Oze Navuka, the leader of the Ligas of Hope organization, says that they plan to send those experts twice a year in order to train and contribute to the treatment in different hospitals in the country. Because we brought five different teams, including ENT, gynecology, and neurosurgery. So we find that there are not enough theater here, so we decided that they would come in shifts. We also plan that the neurosurgery would come twice a year, not only here, but also in another hospitals that have neurosurgery facilities. He also says that this is the fourth time those brain surgeons have come to Rwanda. Since Monday, they have performed more than 18 surgeries, but since they started coming in 2017, they have performed more than 100 surgeries. Nuriat Agasaro, RTV News. Now, the Rwandan government needs $11 billion to achieve the national goals of environment protection and building resilience to climate change. The World Bank supports on climate change and development praises the progress Rwanda has made in protecting the environment, but emphasizes that measures should be taken to prevent climate change from interfering with the achievements. Some of the things that the government has done in the area of environmental protection that leads to sustainable development, including the planning of the institutions that use the government budget, showing the planned projects and looking at the percentage of the budget intended for environmental protection, planting trees and building terraces. In order to continue to avoid the effects of climate change, the Minister of Environment, Mujar Maria Jean d'Arc, says that everyone's role is important. 
The country's long-term goal of achievements by 2030 requires of us 11 billion U.S. dollars in order to deal with climate change, environmental protection, and development. If we don't put climate change at the forefront of our focus, whatever else we will do shall not be sustained. This is why we work closely with entrepreneurs so that we can show them the proper ways in which they can invest in projects that won't negatively affect climate change and even those that did so, that they may change their ways. From 2004 to 2019, Rwanda's economy has been growing at an average of 7.7%. Although the emission of greenhouse gases in Rwanda is only 0.003%, the World Bank's report on climate change and development shows that if no sustainable measures are taken, this development will go backwards. Pablo Benitez Pons, an expert in environmental economics at the World Bank, points out that there are institutions that need to be taken care of so that the environment is preserved and development continues. Rwanda is a very special example, first because it's a country that has already started mainstreaming climate change in its development. So it has been showing leadership on climate action and is ahead of its peers. So it has been a very good starting point. What we have looked when we did the diagnostic is that we try to, um, in addition to evaluate the impacts of climate, the potential risks that the climate has on the economy, we try to come up with a set of policy recommendations. Uh, I think it's important to, to not to only think about financing, where the financing needs are huge, but it's very important to see in how to do things differently. And these are the policy recommendations that we have stated in the report. For example, if we start, start with urban development, uh, there's a very uh, rapid rate of urbanization in Rwanda, and I think it's very important to think about uh, planning. Yeah. So, for example, in, in big cities like Kigali, there has been some uh, strategic planning, master plans, and so on. But the question is, we go to the secondary city, to smaller towns or villages. How can we bring a climate change and environmental considerations at the very beginning, at the early stage of planning? That's something that, if you do it right now, is going to save a lot of money in the next 20, 30, 40 years, where the impacts of climate change are going to be larger. The World Bank's reports on climate change and development in Rwanda shows that while the economy continues to grow and the rain is unpredictable, it would affect the land, people, unemployment, and agriculture income. This means that the country's global production would decrease between 1.5 and 2 percent every year, exports would decrease between 1 and 2.5 percent, and the population's purchasing power would decrease between 1.5 and 3 percent, while taxes would be reduced to between 0.5 and 1 percent. The Ministry of Trade and Industry and the Rwanda Development Board, RDB, said that Rwanda is ready to export goods to member states or countries that ratified the Africa Continental Free Trade Area effective October. Jen Mutoni brings us that report. There are various industrialists who say that they have confidence in the African Continental Free Trade Area and are ready to export various products through the Common Market Program that is going to be officially launched on October 7, 2022 in Ghana. We have been prepared well. We are able to go to the foreign market because we have already started. We have gone to the Congo, DRC, Canada, Kenya, Tanzania. Already we send our garments to that the, the, the foreign market means that we are able to produce any garment needed on foreign market. No problem we have any garment, any UFACO garment. So we have received some message and the calls through to the uh, customers by delivery we made the some client callers and uh, appreciate what we done. So that is a, a happiness we have because we, we received the, the, the feedback from customer according to the delivery we done. In a press conference, the Minister of Trade and Industry, Professor Jean Christostom Gavitinze, said that Rwanda is in a good position in terms of export services to different countries. We Rwanda, you have your export performing, do a gazette channel of your service. Rwanda is in good position in terms of export services. Through, for example, Rwanda, we can do more in the export services and also through IT. But we want to focus more on manufacturing because some industries are showing enough potential. All of this takes time. We don't expect it to happen overnight. 
We have started doing everything possible. Like I said before, Rande has created a special tariff to reduce taxes on exports, so those who want to export will be given a special tariff that has been discussed and agreed upon. Even though we want to start with few goods to various reasons, as we are in the pilot phase, the advantage around what we are doing will help us to better position ourselves. Zefani Nyanghuru, Deputy Chief Executive Officer of the Rwanda Development Board, says that he is confident that Rwandan industries will be able to produce quality products. If you look into the number of local companies that are currently exporting services in several countries in Africa, you know, they are getting good money. So the idea is how do you make sure that they take advantage of, of these uh, agreements and also where they are giving services, they be able uh, to give them advantages which are provided for in these services. I'm sure you've heard about companies which are, for example, in drone technologies, you know, doing, providing services in West Africa. You've heard of um, companies providing IT solution as far as e-taxis are concerned. You know, multiple services, including also, you know, Rwanda Online, you know, discussing with some, some other countries to uh, support as far as the e-government is concerned. So trade in services is also another big component that we're going to put emphasis on. And I believe that along with the goods, these are aspects that we, be, that we keep, um, you know, increasing our, our foreign exchange. Rwanda's intra-Africa trade has doubled in the last five years, increasing from roughly $986 million in 2017 to reach $1.854 million in 2021. The African continental free trade area officially began to operate on January 1, 2021, after which 54 countries have signed the agreement and 35 countries have ratified it in their national laws. Jane Mutoni, RTV News. And on behalf of the entire news production team that made it happen, many thanks for being with us on this edition of Rwanda Television News. My name is Sam Kalisa. And I'm Martina Aveda. And up until next time. Stay safe. And have a good evening. <laughs>